always looking for a good select experience, and the select that just comes with browsers isn't that great. We have a normal select, and then we have another one that can select products. However, these selects are really missing quite a bit. And so I've been looking around, and I wanted to find something that added search functionality. It doesn't have to fetch on the server side, but that would be a nice to have. But my main thing is, I wanted it to play nicely with stimulus. So when I select a company, I want it to also then filter out the products. So we have a dependent select based on their previous choice. And that's what we're going to be looking at in this episode. And the library that I found that seems to be doing a really good job and kind of ticks all of the boxes that I've been looking for is Tom Select. And so with Tom Select, we're going to be able to type in our movies. It's going to fetch the list and it looks like it's going to work. And I really like their documentation because they start with a basic input and then they start adding on different options. And from what I could tell, it also plays really nicely with stimulus controllers, which is going to be a big requirement. So here we have our companies, and then we also have our products. As we select a company, the search products then gets filtered down. And so that's exactly what I'm looking for. And for this example, we're not going to worry too much about what the server is going to do with the request. So the form that we have, it's not going to do anything because we want to focus on our actual selects. So in this example, it's a Rails 8 application with import maps, but it should work fine with ES build as well. We have a company and a company has many products. So initially, which you typically don't want to do this, where you're querying from the view, but just as an example, I think that this is okay. But just keep in mind that if you have thousands of companies and tens of thousands of products, then you could experience increased loading times and some browser slowness. And so the first thing that we're going to do is run the bin import map pin, and we're going to pin the tom dash select. If we go into our config and then the import map, you'll see that it downloaded, but this isn't quite what we want. So I'm going to unpin this and we're going to pin the tom dash select and we're going to use a CDN from JS deliver. And the reason why we're wanting to do this is simply because the Tom Select didn't work properly without the ESM build. And so the CDN will provide that and we should be good. And then I want to generate a stimulus controller and I'm just going to call it Select. And the reason why I'm building this stimulus controller is I just want to get Tom Select working. So we'll import in Tom Select and we'll import it in from the Tom Dash Select. When this stimulus controller connects, We'll create a new instance of Tom Select and we'll just call this.element. So now we can go into our application and we can add that data controller for our select. And so once we get this added, we can start up our Rails application with the bin dev and things don't look quite right. So if we come back and if we get rid of our CSS that we added for the display block, which is then going to make that select visible, we can save this. And it still doesn't look quite right. We still have our original select, and then we have the select from Tom Select. And so the reason for this is that we are missing the CSS. This is going to be much easier if you are using ES build, but because we're using import maps, we are going to add in a new style sheet. So we'll add in a link to that same Tom Select path from the JS deliver. And then we need to go into the dist CSS and the tom-select.css, and we'll specify it's a style sheet. So once we save our changes, we can come back, refresh the page, and that looks good now. So we have our styling, and we can select our products just as we could before. It's always good to have a deconstructor, which is our disconnect, where before we unload the page or the stimulus controller, we want to make sure that if this.element.tomselect then we're going to call this.element.tomselect and we'll call destroy on there. So we'll save this and just make sure that the page works and it does. So that's good. And we don't have any JavaScript errors either. So that's also good. And so now, whenever we select a company, we want to make sure that it also selects a product. But that does add some complications 
because I don't want to update this select controller because it's working fine the way it is, especially in situations where I don't want some kind of dependent select. So instead, I'm going to generate another stimulus controller and I'm just going to call it the select with dependent. And this stimulus controller is going to have a lot of the same functionality. So I'm just going to copy it over. And so that looks good. On our index page, we'll update the data controller with the select with dependent, and then we'll test it out just to make sure that it still works. And so now, whenever we make a change on this stimulus controller, we want to call something or trigger an event. So let's go ahead and build the code. And so we want a data action. And on the change event, we want to call our select with dependent. And let's just call the update action. We will need some kind of URL so we can add the data select with dependent and we'll just add a URL value. And for now, I'm just going to make it a hashtag because we don't really have any endpoints yet. Within our new stimulus controller, we'll create our static values. We'll have our URL and that will be a string. We also need our update function and we'll just set our URL is equal to a new URL from this dot URL value, and we'll set the window location origin, which may or may not be needed. We can fetch this URL and let's just get a JSON response. So in our headers, we'll just pass in the accept in the application or slash JSON. And then we can create a promise. So once we make the request, we'll get our response and then we'll call the response dot JSON. And then we can do something with that JSON data. So at this point, we need a few additional things. We need to be able to specify what we want to target. So we're going to have a target value. And because this could be used for many different things, also want to have a parameter value. Because when we send this over to our Rails application, we may not want to just use the ID value or the string ID for the parameters, but instead let's use company underscore ID. And for our target value, I'm just going to call this the product underscore select, which does mean that on this product, we will need to add an ID and we'll add the ID product select. So we have a couple more values that we need to add. We have our param and let's say if we're not given a default, then we'll just pass an ID and then we'll have a target, which will be a string. So we can get our target because it's not within the same stimulus controller, we're not going to be able to use this dot target value or something. And using a stimulus outlet, I think would be a bit much. So I'm just going to get our document and we'll get the element by the ID and we can pass in this dot target value. We'll check if the target exists, then we can do something. So let's go ahead and build our routes. So at this point, we're basically ready to start inserting in some data. So let's go into our routes and create an endpoint. I'm going to have a namespace. We'll call it the searches. And I'm doing this because I don't want to use any existing actions for the products or the companies, simply because these controllers are going to do one thing and it needs to be really simple. So we'll then have a resources for our products and we only need the index action. So we can generate that controller for these searches and then the products. I'm not going to include the index action because we're not going to need a view. And another reason why I like namespacing this and creating its own controller is if we had any kind of authorization or needed to limit the records, we could do that right within here and it would be nice and clean. So we can get our products and we can call the product.where. And in this case, if we have a company ID, then we need to filter that out. But if we don't have a company ID present, then we want to return all of the records. So what we need to do is create some kind of method. I'm just going to call it filter by company. And this is a pattern that I really like because if we return an empty hash from this method, then it's not going to do anything. So we can check if the params company ID is not present, then we're just going to return that empty hash. Otherwise, we can provide a hash for the company underscore ID and then the params and the company ID. We can finally render some JSON and we'll render it with the products.toJSON. 
Of course, if your product is a really large table, then you could just limit this out to just the name and ID. But when we make this request, we are going to have another problem. But before we get there, let's just go ahead and update our URL. We can get that path with the Rails routes dash G. And I'll just type in searches because this is what we're grabbing. And so we have the searches products path. So that's what we'll put in here. And now we should be good to test this. I'll refresh the page. I'll click on one of these and the products didn't do anything. And that's expected. If we come into our console and if we make the request, you'll see that we did fetch the products and we got a response. But the response isn't what we were looking for because this is returning everything. And that's actually also expected right now because when we're making the request, we're not passing in that company ID. So in our URL, we need to add the search params and we can set this dot param value, which again, that param value is going to be our company ID and we can set it with this dot element dot value. So now we are passing it in. If we come back, refresh the page, we'll select a product. You now see that we have our company ID is equal to one. And if we look into there, our response is now limited to just those products. If I select a different one, we can check and verify that it is updated and we got different products. So now we need to update the UI. But the problem with this is that for the value and for the name or the text content, it may not always be the name attribute and we may not want the value to always be the ID. So we do need to add a few additional parameters. So let's just call this the target name. And I'm actually going to pass in a default value of name and a target value will set equal to ID as a default value. So that way in our view, we don't need to modify anything else because we are using these as a default. However, you could pass in the target name value if you wanted this to be title or something different. So if we have our target, I'm just going to set a constant for the value key and we'll set it equal to this dot target value value, which is a little bit strange. So you can name this differently if you wanted to. And then the name key will set equal to this dot target name value. And I'm just setting this because we're going to be using it multiple times. But there's one other problem here. If our target select is a Tom select, then we need to do one thing. Otherwise, if it's a standard select, we can do something else. So we can set our target dot enter HTML is equal to nothing. And then we can loop over our data. We can loop over it with a for each. We'll have an option. And this option will set a constant option is equal to our document dot create element. And we're creating an option. We can set our option dot value is equal to the option. And then we want to grab our value key. We can set our option dot text content is equal to our option and then the name key. Finally, we can call on our target to append the child, which will add it into the select. And so this should work if we weren't using Tom select for our second select box. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that. So we have just a normal old select. We'll then update this. And now you see that it's been updated to just those products. If we change it again, that works. But the problem here is that we were using Tom select for it. So we do need to take that into consideration and we can call on our target dot Tom select and we can clear the options. We can then loop over all of our data that we got back from the server and we can call the target Tom select dot add option. And we want to pass in a hash where we have our value and that's going to be our option key value. And for the text, we'll set to the option name key. Once we're done looping over all of the options, we can call our target dot Tom select and then the refresh options. And if you want to prevent the secondary box or our target select from opening up automatically, we can then pass in a false. So now we'll select our company. We can then select our products. We can select a different company. And then we can select our different product. And so that all works. And so I really like this library because it is pretty extensive. You don't have to use all the options 
But one that I did not cover that would be important would be the load functionality. And so that's going to grab the remote data when it connects, and it's going to act very similar. And so this would be the other option that I would add in if I was building this out. So you would need some kind of URL to load in the initial data for that first select. And another thing that I thought was pretty neat is on the large data set, this is with 15,000 items. It does take a fraction of a second to load, but it is really fast at searching. So I do suspect that this could be used on a larger application with a lot of records, but it's still going to be a good idea to query your server if you are dealing with a lot of data. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.